Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the last session of the day. Um, we have Alex West, a PhD student from Leiden University who works on the manuscript edition of West Java and um, well, today he is going to talk to us about why did people in medieval Java use so many uh, different scripts. Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm not really going to try and answer this question because I don't know if it can be answered at our present level of, of knowledge about the island, really. But I am going to try and pose a bunch of possible factors that influenced uh, the range of scripts that were used in Java uh, over what I call the, the medieval period. Not many, not many people use that term, actually, but, but I do. So. Um, so I'm going to start talking about uh, Java in general, uh, just so you have an idea of actually where it is. I feel like maybe uh, some of you don't know. Um, and what I mean by the Middle Ages is roughly the 4th century to uh, the very beginning of the 16th uh, of the Common Era. And uh, the, I'm then going to talk a bit about the mechanics of Brahmic alpha syllabaries, which are the kind of scripts that were used in uh, Java, in fact, Southeast Asia um, until uh, modern times. Then I'll talk about the rapid diversification of scripts and indigenization of scripts uh, that happened in medieval Java, especially after the 10th century. And uh, I'll show you some, what I consider anyway, to be some quite fascinating examples of scripts from Java, uh, particularly the bronzes, um, but also some of these stone palm leaf texts and some, also some copper plates, which for some reason haven't listed there. And then I'm going to speculate uh, as to the reason for this um, extraordinary variety of scripts. And basically, uh, it's a combination of agency, which I'm using in a very uh, plebeian fashion uh, to mean human conscious decision making. Um, and uh, a, a range of different possibilities there, including aesthetics, novelty, uh, politics, this kind of thing. Uh, but then also climate, and a model uh, that looks at, at Java as, as basically a, an equatorial or tropical place uh, in which the destruction of manuscripts was such a regular occurrence uh, because of the heat, humidity, and insects that scripts were forced to change simply because uh, copies of manuscripts would always be based on recent copies. So you'd have recent copies of recent copies of recent copies. And so any changes to the script would then build up uh, over time, leading to lots of unique variants in different parts of the island. Um, so this is the modern Republic of Indonesia, and a little bit of Malaysia, and Java is uh, this one here. It's not the biggest island, but it is by far the most populous. Um, there it is zoomed in. You can see Bali is uh, slightly to the east, and Sumatra slightly to the northwest. Java is the most populous island in the world. It has about 145 million inhabitants, so more than Japan and about the same as Russia. It's a little bit larger than England at 139,000 square kilometers, so it's, it's really not very big. Um, and it's about seven degrees south of the equator, so it has year-round high heat and high humidity, and seasonal differences are basically a wet season and a dry season. And it's home to three languages in the Malay or Polynesian branch of the Austronesian language family, namely Javanese. I say there that it has 80 million speakers, but uh, some people say it has more like 95 million. Um, Sundanese, which is only spoken in West Java, has about 40 million speakers. Uh, and Malay or Indonesian, which is the lingua franca on the island, but also in the Republic of Indonesia generally. Java is also the most volcanically active island in the world, so it has an extremely mountainous uh, landscape, at least in West Java and also in the extreme east. But there are some, some flatlands as well that are created by um, Volcanic silt basically building up and creating a, a huge coastal plain. Uh, temperatures dip below 10 degrees only at the peaks of the very highest mountains, so average temperatures are in the 20s and on the north coast even in the 30s uh, over the course of the year, which is like, it's hot, basically. <laughs> uh, rainfall is high overall as well, and in western parts of West Java, the dry season is only about a month long, which is, uh, but there are uh, huge differences across the island. In East Java, it can be as long as nine months. And West Java historically has had a much uh, lower population density than Central and East Java as a result of this, because the high rainfall means that nutrients are leached from the soil, and it's not really good for uh, growing rice, which has uh, historically been the staple. Anyway. So what do I mean by medieval Java? Basically, I'm talking about uh, the period between the 4th and the early 16th centuries, the common era, when Java was dominated by so-called Indianized kingdoms. Uh, largely based in central Java until about the beginning of the 10th century, and then east Java from the 10th century until the 16th. And the elites of these kingdoms practiced a mix of Hindu, Buddhist, and indigenous cults, and from about the 14th century on also Islam, 
And for this reason, the period is often called the Hindu Buddhist period. But I prefer the term medieval as it has fewer religious connotations and sort of leads us to connect Java to other parts of the uh, Afro Eurasian medieval world. Uh, most of the inscriptions that I'm going to show you, um, that they're nearly all inscriptions, were produced during the East Javanese period. So that's the period between uh, 929 and about 1500, or possibly 1486, depending on, on uh, what sources you believe. Most of the inscriptions are in Old Javanese. In fact, that's a huge range, a uh, huge number and range of inscriptions in Old Javanese. But that begins in about the 8th century. Uh, and the ones before that are mostly in Sanskrit, including the very oldest inscriptions, and also Old Malay. And from about uh, 1330, and this is quite controversial actually to date it in that way, but from about 1330, there are also some inscriptions in Old Sundanese, which is the language of West Java. So all of these scripts are Brahmic alpha syllabaries, um, meaning that they're based on Brahmi, or derived in some way from Brahmi, which was a syllabic script developed in India, I say in the, around 400 BC, but okay, a lot of Indian people get very angry and say it's much older than that. And the fundamental basis of the script did not change very much in uh, early Java. So we're basically seeing variation in the forms of the graphemes themselves rather than in their functions. So when I say we're using lots of different scripts, I'm, I mean lots of mutually unintelligible variants of the same script, kind of, the same writing system. Reading direction with most of these scripts, uh, in fact all of them really, is left to right, but there are some exceptions, uh, as you'll see, with some of the bond scripts later on. So the, the fundamental... Uh, kinds of graphemes that you get in these scripts are uh, syllables, or the, the main graphemes represent syllables, which are normally uh, a consonant with an inherent vowel a. So the, the syllable ka would be represented by a single grapheme. And then if you wanted to write the syllable ki, you would uh, use the uh, syllable ka and then add a little diacritic to represent the, the sound e. And in Indonesian, uh, the syllables are known as aksara from the uh, Sanskrit word for letter or script, and the diacritics are known as sandangan, which is the Japanese word for clothing, because they uh, sort of clothe <laughs> the aksara. That's a, actually a huge simplification, and there are lots of different kinds of aksara, and sometimes you can call the sandangan aksara, because they're also letters, but uh, let's forget about that for now. Uh, so I can show you this horribly blurred image of, uh, <laughs> of a Sundanese manuscript. Uh, in, in real life, these uh, letters are actually about three millimeters high, so they're really quite small. But here you can see um, in the Rectangles, we've got the aksara, we've got the syllables, and in the circles, we've got uh, the sandangan that modify them. So the first one there is the aksara ha, the second one is the aksara ta, but this is not read ha ta because this is the uh, vowel u, and this sign over here is called the virama or paten in Javanese, which cancels the inherent vowel of the aksara, so this is actually read ut. Okay, so a little brief aside about Java and paleography and uh, what kind of research has been done on these scripts in the past. Basically, there hasn't been very much in the sense of looking at the scripts as scripts or as a window onto the politics of Java. Instead, the focus has been on reading texts and being able to read texts in different scripts and not really paying much attention to the scripts themselves at all. So we've got some... Uh, basically, the, this is the, the heavy hitters of, of Java and paleography and they go back to... 1882 with Paulus Dabble from Al in the Indus Alphabeta, which is just a, a catalogue of different scripts that are used in various inscriptions and manuscripts in Java from the earliest times up to the 19th century when he was writing. And that is not used as a way of analysing scripts at all anymore, but it is used for reading inscriptions, and that's really all most Indonesia specialists are interested in doing. So. The question that I'm asking here, why were so many different scripts used, is not one that would naturally occur to most specialists on the island. Um, I've listed a few things there in case you want to follow up. We've got a few good things on various little topics, but it's all very piecemeal. So there's some stuff on code ecology, some stuff on bronze inscriptions that's actually very good. Um, and there's a lot of stuff on later Javanese texts, because of course there's a huge range uh, of, of much later Javanese material. Um, but basically, we don't have a lot of monographs. People in Indonesia are very curious about this about the scripts that were uh, used in, in medieval times. And there is quite a lively blogging and Facebook community. But again, very few monographs are produced. So this uh, knowledge is, is kind of ephemeral. And if the internet ever goes down, then we're going to lose it all. Unfortunately, earlier scholarship has given us some pretty unhelpful categories when it comes to looking at these scripts. Um, so we've, we've got kawi, which used to be quite a, a specific term for an indigenized form of palavo, which is the original script used on the island from South India. 
but now is, is used, it's in popular use for really any pre-modern Javanese script. If it's not the modern Javanese script or the Roman alphabet, then it's Kawi. And if it's sort of blocky, um, then it's often called quadratic, uh, which is very helpful. And uh, sometimes it's called Kaduri quadratic, Kaduri being the East Javanese kingdom that dominated the island between 1049 and 1222. Uh, but no, I don't think there's any reason to connect it with that kingdom at all. Uh, it could be there is a connection, but certainly the scripts were used much later than 1220. Um, nearly all of the scripts that I'm going to show you are known from inscriptions. Uh, we have very few manuscripts, um, and the very oldest manuscripts in Indonesia date to the 14th century. We have maybe a handful of those. So nearly everything here is an inscription, and nearly all of these categories are, are going to be based on inscriptions. So they don't give us a full picture of what writing was like uh, in early Java. So the first inscriptions in Java appeared about 1600 years ago. Um, the oldest dated inscriptions from the 8th century but uh, the earliest have been dated on paleographic grounds, and that's very easy because the earliest scripts are basically South Indian scripts adopted without change. And it's probable that the first scribes were actually themselves from South India because the language is Sanskrit and the script is called Pallava. You can see an example here. Um, this is one of the oldest inscriptions in Java. It's actually in West Java, which normally does not have very many inscriptions. Um, and it's the G.R. Kern inscription. It's 4th or 5th century. Um, the script is known as Pallava, as I said, and it, it's kind of loopy and swirly. It has all these exaggerated ascenders and descenders. Um, it's, quite a, it's quite attractive, actually. I think, well, up to you. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the forms here are not yet distinguishable from, from Indian ones, and indeed uh, the identical to scripts that are also known from, from Borneo, the Malay Peninsula, the Myanmar, other parts of Southeast Asia at the, at the same time. So for about a, a century or two, there is a common script in use uh, from South India to um, Island Southeast Asia and beyond. But then there's a rapid diversification and indigenization, so called, of Pallava, especially in Java. And uh, nearly all of the scripts that were used in Java in the Middle Ages developed locally from this original Pallava prototype. Uh, that's basically the key point here that most of the variation that we see developed in Java, an island only slightly larger than England. So now I'm going to show you some examples of what I mean. And obviously, it would be impossible to summarize all the diversity that we see. Well, actually, that's not obvious, is it? That's not at all obvious. <laughs> no, but there, there is a huge amount of diversity, um, so, uh, <laughs> as you'll see. Um, but here I'm going to focus on the most interesting examples and uh, try to give an impression of, of what's out there, really. Uh, so most of the examples, as I say, have been taken from copper plates, um, stones, which are mostly andesite because it is such a volcanic island and, you know, the uh, subduction zone. Also bronzes, which are easily the strangest of these. And uh, in one case, I think I've only got one palm leaf text, and that's the one I'm working from West China. Some of the examples are unique, so they're known only from one inscription, or from one location, uh, or two, one or two locations over a course of a couple of decades. Um, and I hope you'll see what I mean by that uh, in a minute. So here's the first one that, that we can see. It's a subject blurry, but all these photographs are quite old. Uh, they were taken by a Dutch opera singer in the 19th century called Isidore von Kinsberge. And he left us all these uh, beautiful photographs that are now accessible for free on the Leiden, Leiden Digital Library. And this is an inscribed linga, a linga being an, an iconic or phallic representation of the god Shiva. And it's from the, the central Javanese period, so it's before the 10th century. You can see that it is much less swirly, loopy, and doesn't have those long ascenders and descenders like the Pallava script. Uh, it's also uh, carved in a, a sort of much more shallow fashion. It's, but it is fundamentally just a simplified or modified form of Pallava. The same sort of applies to this one, which is the very oldest inscription from East Java. Uh, it's from Dinoyo, um, and it's probably from 760. I'm not sure on what basis that is dated. It might be that the stone has a date. This isn't really my period, so. But you can see it's less angular than the previous slide, but it is ultimately just a modification of the Pallava script at this point. And if you compare the uh, Aksara side by side, you probably see that, which I did later on. Then skipping forward a few centuries, we've got the Singosari inscription. This is probably based on an ink script using uh, a reed pen on Nipa leaves. Uh, it's now in the Museo Nacional in Jakarta, and it's about probably about that big, so it's really not a huge stone. But it has this uh, quite lovely, elegant script, and it's you know it has this lovely aspect um, where it's all on you know, beautiful straight line, lovely inscription. Um, I don't think you're going to be impressed by the diversity so far. They all look fairly similar. Um, <laughs> the same applies really to this copper plate, which is um, <laughs> in the British Library. And the British Library says 
it was it was produced anywhere between 1000 and 1500 AD, which is very helpful. Uh, I think it's probably uh, 12th or 13th century, but I'm not sure. Um, but again, it's it's quite similar to the previous examples. But this one, uh, this is actually from Bali, so I'm kind of cheating a bit. I'm saying this is all Java. This is from Bali, um, but it's actually a very good example of the extremely angular scripts that we find from the uh, East Javanese period on copper plates. It has this very chiselled in appearance. It sort of looks like it was created by a machine, and it gives a. I mean, I find it very difficult to read. I feel like that may have been the point. And then uh, we get onto the so-called quadratic script. So this is the sort of canonical quadratic script. This kind of script where it protrudes from the surface of the stone is not really known uh, from India. This is very much a Javanese invention. It's from, again from the East Javanese period, but I don't know exactly the date. So again, after the 10th century, probably uh, 11. And you can see there's a kind of aesthetic intent here. It's an artistic product. It's supposed to look grand and impressive, and quite interesting. And you can see actually that there's a gecko crawling over the surface of the stone there. It's been carved in and also some flowers along the edge. So the intent here is not simply to communicate information, but to create something quite attractive. Uh, here's another uh, quadratic inscription. It's quite <laughs> similar to the previous one. Um, but you can see how, what the advantage for the, the carver is here. All you need to do is really chop out a rectangle and then chisel in some little bits to, to make the letters. This is from the East Javanese period again. Um, I don't know very much about it. I just took it from the Leiden Digital Library as an example. Then we get on to scripts like this, which are often categorized as... Um, quadratic because they have a sort of rectangular form but again this doesn't protrude from the surface of the rock it has all these little extra flourishes like these seemingly unnecessary loops which I'm not sure what they do really apart from look good um, I tried to take a photo of this one in the National Museum it is accessible it's very easily accessible but uh, it's in quite a dark area so my photographs didn't come out as well as Van Kien's variants and here's a, a particularly strange script this is from uh, in fact this stone is dated the script the date there which you wouldn't be able to read it if you could see it actually, uh, is uh, 1363 in the Shaka calendar, which is equivalent to 1441 in the uh, Kong era. This script is known only from two sites, uh, Suku and Jeto, on the slopes of Mount Lao in central Java near Soro. Um, it is not quadratic, it's very blobby, it doesn't have that square shape, but it does protrude from the surface of the rock, and all of the inscriptions in this script do the same thing and have the same kind of weird blobby characteristic. <coughs> and there's this one which is actually roughly contemporary with the previous one um, from Kovali, which is in um, West Java. Some, pe some people say it's 14th century, so I'm just going to go with that, but I think it's a little bit later. But you can see it's, it's written in a completely different way. This is a completely different style of script. Um, it's uniquely Sundanese. This is used for writing the Sundanese language. All of the preceding examples were used for uh, Old Javanese. The main differences are in the shapes of the graphemes, which obviously you can't really see until I show you them side by side. Um, but also there, there are changes in the grapheme inventory um, for old, writing old Sundanese, which doesn't have retroflexes or a uh, distinction between aspirated and un unaspirated consonants like old Javanese does. And so it just got rid of those. It just got rid of all the uh, aspirated ones, all the retroflexes and the long vowels. And we're not really sure where this script came from, actually. It just sort of appears um, on a few stones at one location in West Java, and uh, it seems to be a kind of uh, adaptation of a, of a palm leaf script, perhaps. Nobody really knows. And then there's this uh, text which uh, I've been working on. This is actually, I actually transcribed this entire text. This is probably the only one I can easily sight read. And it's on Lontar, which is uh, Borassus flabellifer. It's the leaf of uh, a palm, Borassus flabellifer. This is from West Java, and it's also in Old Sundanese, but the script has been radically modified since the Kowali stones. This is probably from the late 15th century. Um, it's not inked or charcoal, it's just cut into the surface of the leaf using a, a knife called a panor. And as I said, these are about three millimeters uh, in height, so they are really, really tiny. But actually the most extreme variation that we see uh, is in the bronzes. Um, most commonly bells, slit drums, and mirror hands. I think there are quite a few other different kinds, um, but I'll show you some pretty wild examples here. And these scripts are usually called quadratic, which, as I say, is, is basically a sort of meaningless term, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. But um, this one actually is basically quadratic. It's very similar to the so-called quadratic scripts that we find on stones. Um, and, it, I mean, it's a very simple little inscription. It's just one word. It says, Shrahana, 
probably from the old Javanese root sra, meaning gift, um, is probably a passive, a realist form, but with a very strange spelling, so we don't really know exactly what it means. But this one is, is probably the most normal of the foreign scripts, because when you get onto something like this one, which is unfortunately a bit blurry again, the very old photographs, this is the Sadapainan slip drum. Slip drums are a very common instrument in uh, uh, Aina Southeast Asia generally. Normally they're made of a log that's been hollowed out, and you just bang them sort of to get everyone's attention in the village. And the script here is completely unique to this drum. It's not found anywhere else. It consists of these odd little rectangles that have teased out edges, little indentations. It can only really be read because around the top there is a date in what's called Chandra Sankala, which uses words to represent numbers. It's extremely formulaic, so that we can... Unfortunately, uh, some of the characters that are used in that are also used in this script, uh, on this inscription, sorry. So this one here says Ma, and it looks like no other Ma that we see. This is what Ma normally looks like. It doesn't just look like a rectangle. Um, and this is from about 1286, I think. It, obviously, it is dated, but I just forgot what the date is, I'm afraid. Um, and then we get even more extreme examples like the Pudrunga slip drum. Again, I'm cheating a bit because it's from Bali. It's probably 15th century, but we're not entirely sure of the date. Um, the text is Old Javanese. And there's a sort of decorative element on the left-hand side of every one of the Aksaras, which actually you can see better in this image. Um, here, like this little weird little flourish it has. It serves no purpose in terms of distinguishing the Aksaras, but it is, uh, so it seems to be simply decorative. Then there's a, a particular script, this is sort of final one. This is a special script that was used for inscribing bronze mirror handles, just cast into the handle. And the forms of the Aksaras are unique to the script. Uh, but like the uh, other bronze scripts, it's read from bottom to top. Some of the sundown are used a bit differently, so I'm afraid I have to get the esoteric here, but the chitrak, which is a little dot that appears above the aksara to add a villa nasal stop to the syllable coda, is replaced by the use of the aksara na with a pattern to kill the inherent vowel. So I could probably illustrate that on there if you're interested during the Q&A. And uh, some of the aksaras here and, and the text, as a result, have yet to be deciphered. Um, so, and there's very, very little literature on the subject. The last thing is by uh, Kruk, who unfortunately died in a Japanese internment camp, uh, a Japanese prison camp, sorry, in Java uh, in the 1940s. And that's what it looks like. It's a, it's a very odd script. Again, we've got this sort of diagonal canting of the uh, aksaras. It's read from uh, bottom to top, and it always ends in this uh, decorative virama or paten, which cancels the inherent vowel. So we know that it is read from bottom to top. It's not. There's no other way to read it. Uh, this one here says Ya Yang. We don't know what that means because it's not attested anywhere else in, in the corpus of old Javanese text, so we have no idea. Uh, when I first saw this one in the Ashmolean Museum a few years ago, I thought it probably, like, it doesn't look like writing. I didn't believe that it was, but it's sort of, it, you know, it was, apparently it is. So I put, to put together a little collage of, of the scripts so you can see um, the differences side by side. And it, you have to remember that Java is an island roughly the size of England, and most of the variation, barring the uh, two of the top left there, most of this variation comes, uh, comes about over a period of about 500 years. So really not a particularly long time. And if you compare the Aksara side by side like this, you can see that there are some uh, gigantic changes and, and variants that we see. And in fact, this is uh, the variation that we see over the course of about one century, between 1351 with this one and uh, 1451 with this one. So this is all within, you know, on the same island, about the size of England. Imagine if people in Northumbria uh, were using scripts as different as this from people in, in Cornwall. Uh, it would seem a bit bizarre. And then you can see uh, also with the Aksara Ma, I've, I've gone all the way back to the Palava inscriptions with this one. Number one is the form that appears on the Palava inscription, sort of the blob with antennae coming off it. Uh, but then that, uh, because of cursivization, that develops really into a sort of three with a little bit hanging off. And then it's experimented with in, in, on different writing surfaces um, and in different ways, so resulting in the forms that you see in, in 8 to 13, which are all really quite strange. So I, I hope you, you'll agree with me that there, there is a lot of diversity there. Actually, there's a lot of different kinds of scripts that are in use. And the question is, uh, how can we account for it? So here's where I'm just going to sort of throw spaghetti at the wall and hope it sticks. Um, so there's a possibility of elite exclusivity, I suppose, of, Developing a, a unique writing system is a good way of keeping the plebs out. 
Um, but we don't actually know whether writing, uh, reading and writing were elite activities in medieval Japan. So we don't have the information for that. There was a focus in uh, elite culture in medieval Java on aesthetic appreciation of a very particular kind. So I'll talk about that in some more detail in a minute. There's also the possibility of uh, social isolations influencing um, the, the development of these scripts because it is such a mountainous place that different communities would be cut off from one another. But actually there's quite a lot of evidence for people moving about Java quite a lot over the medieval period, so I'm not convinced that this is the, the main reason for it. In the case of the Sundanese scripts, I think there's quite a large element of ethnic or national pride with the, the politics of Sunda versus Java in the sense of the Javanese-speaking parts of the island, because Sunda was largely independent of Java in the sense of the Javanese polity um, for much of the, the medieval period. But uh, in the 14th century, there was an attempt to try and take over uh, in Sunda, and there was a, an incident that is often referred to as the, the Bubak incident, in which a Sundanese delegation to the capital of Java, Maitrapai, was uh, massacred. And it is notable that from the 14th century on, some of these scripts take a very different trajectory to Javanese ones. But I think the most important factors here are really the writing surfaces and the disintegration of manuscripts uh, as a result of environmental conditions. Basically, palm leaves disintegrate very quickly in the tropics, and I'm assuming that palm leaves are the basis of most of these scripts, that palm leaf manuscripts uh, are where these scripts really originated. This means that there's a high turnover of manuscripts um, and so you're going to get copyists uh, copying texts. They're going to copy whatever the, mo the, the most recent form that they know is, and these changes are going to build up over time. A very basic model, but I think probably effective. Steps have always been taken to ensure the longevity of palm leaves, uh, and there's a, a good uh, uh, description of a procedure from, from uh, Bali by Dick van der May. But in practice, this was always a problem, and in fact, it was recognized as a problem in the, in the Middle Ages in Indonesia, there are several inscriptions on copper plates from Bali that tell us that people did worry about the disintegration of their manuscripts and they wanted very important information copied onto copper plates. So basically, there's copies of recent copies of recent copies. It's going to lead up to a, a build-up of unique variants. This is the little model. But then there's also a very complex relationship between different writing surfaces. So we've got three very closely related scripts there. The first one is so-called Aksara Buddha Gunung, or Mountain Buddhist Script on the left which is an ink script um, used with a reed pen on nipa leaves, nipa being nipa fruticans, a, a common sugar palm. And the next two scripts are probably based on it in some way. So the, the next one is actually the old Sunday script that was incised into Lombara leaves, the one that I'm looking at at the moment. It's using a knife on the surface of the leaf, and it, obviously that's going to lead to some changes in, in the forms. And then finally, there's the Simosari inscription, which is the one uh, we talked about before, from 1351. And this is on the surface of an andesite stone, so you have a lot more flexibility. You can just sort of carve a nice round shape if you want, so you're not confined by the, the reed pen. But what's particularly interesting is that that second script that was used for uh, carving into lontar leaves with a knife was then used as the basis of an ink script later on. So this is uh, actually a colonial period manuscript of the Charita Waruga Guru, and it's on European paper with an ink pen. But what's interesting is that they used the script that had originally been developed for writing on Lontar with a knife. So clearly people were not particularly, they were not confined to the use of one particular script on one particular writing surface. Finally, uh, there's the issue of aesthetics. I've actually, unfortunately, used two different transcription systems there, <laughs> Lando and Galamon. Uh, this mm, should actually be the same as this one. It should be an N with a dot above it. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, so the appreciation of beauty of a very particular kind was very important in elite circles in Java. Um, I think beauty is quite an inaccurate term here. It's, it's more like a sort of generalized aesthetic appreciation or appreciation of particularly interesting piquant moments. Um, so taking a, a scenic walk, for example, or in one case from the Kakawin Shivaratri Kalpa, which is the last Kakawin uh, made in, in, uh, written in Java in the 1470s, uh, watching the dew uh, you know, glint in the sun on the wings of a heron as it flies across a pond you know, in the early hours of the morning. So should script design be seen as part of this aesthetic appreciation? Obviously not in all cases, certainly not with the Sundanese scripts, but perhaps with a lot of the bronzes, which are very elaborate and peculiar. Um, so as I said, I'm using agency... Why well, did I say that? So I'm using agency in a very boring way. Uh, I mean agency in the sense of just humans making decisions, and I think you have to see climate and human agency as entangled or entwined here. I think people in medieval Java could probably have avoided changes to their scripts if they wanted to. If you look at the examples of the Avestan Garthas, 
or the Sanskrit Vedas, we're talking about compositions that were preserved phoneme for phoneme over the course of centuries, if not millennia. And speech is, of course, much more ephemeral than even the flimsiest palm leaf. So I think, basically, the successive climate-induced destruction of palm leaf manuscripts is only the beginning of the explanation of this uh, phenomenon. Right. And I've got a bit of a bibliography there in case you're interested, and I'll close with that so you can...